Happy New Year! Well, not actually. This video is coming out probably two months after the New Year's, but this is the first video of 2023, so whatever. I'm wearing this hat. 2023 was, let's just say, an interesting year for movies. I wouldn't say we got miss after miss, but definitely wouldn't say we got bangers left and right. In my opinion, a lot of movies this year just didn't pique my interest. But I still wanted to make this video. And did you honestly think I would have maybe like five animated movies on it and that's it? Hell no. So before the new year hit, I sat my butt down into my sofa and binged a ton of movies this year. Some movies made me go, why didn't I check these out again? But some made me say, oh, that's why I didn't check these movies out. Whoa, someone's passionate. You really want to hear my opinion that badly? Yeah, you're right. Let's start the list. You know, when I started this list, I was mainly excited to see what was my favorite movie and my least favorite movie of last year. But what I didn't expect was for the sixth Ice Age movie to be the worst thing I watched last year. Disney couldn't just leave it alone. They already dug the grave of Blue Sky, but they also had to defile the grave. They needed just one more franchise to run into the ground. Let me just say it right now. You will not remember anything about this movie after you watch it. Time moves so slow. And even then, scenes are rushed. Congratulations, Disney. You made a movie that both drags out while also rushing its story along. Great. They introduce all these new characters and just act like we know them. I don't know if they appear in anything else, but I certainly don't care. They turn the only good part of Collision Course, that being Buck himself, annoying. Sid, Manny, and Diego are... You know what? Now that I think about it, all the original characters have maybe two minutes of screen time it's all about the possums, your favorite characters from the original, right? So yeah, if you're wondering, this is worse than the fifth Ice Age movie by a long shot. Why was this even made? I could just see guys in a business meeting like, Sir, our data shows that we need a movie that nobody asked for. Hmm, a new Marvel show? If we start making our new Marvel shows, the VFX team will pass out. Hmm, any other ideas, boys? Hmm... Ice Age 6? I love it! You're getting a raise, Jim. I wonder if my blankie's at the Lost City. Uh, I thought Brad Pitt was funny. Yeah, that's about it. This movie sucked. And the trailers didn't look half bad. But the final product is dreadful. While Buck Wild made me feel nothing inside, this movie made me feel rage. The beginning, you know, was competent. I liked it. Watching Loretta trying to, you know, write her book and get it published. You know, it's not the most entertaining thing out there, but it's watchable. You're not exactly clawing your eyes out yet. But then she gets kidnapped by a creepy dude, stuck to a chair, and now we're in a jungle. And now I wanted to claw my eyes out. I essentially blocked out the rest of the movie. Not entertaining in the slightest, and for a movie trying to be a comedy... It's not funny. 60% of the comedy is just overacting to something minor. And 40% is just bad. Don't watch this movie. It's a waste of time. What do you think I look like? A jackass? <sighs> is this going to be a tradition? Where Disney has to make a crappy live action adaptation of their beloved movies. If it is, then this year we got Disney's live action Pinocchio. Which is terrible. Alright, positives, uh, positives, um, ah, positives, uh, I thought Funland looked pretty good. Yeah, that's it. Oh, speaking of which, bringing this film to live action ruins all the charm the original had, and all the elements that you didn't really question in the original, like the humanoid fox, now stick out way more because they are seen right next to humans, and it looks so bad. Tom Hanks sounds bored out of his mind while watching this, like he actively wants the suffering to be over, and, you know, who can blame him? The only good part of the weird fox now is Keegan-Michael Key's vocal performance. 
Uh, the donkey is also like 10 times more horrifying. It still had nothing to the plot, really. I also have to mention the clocks in Geppetto's house. They're all references to Disney movies and projects, and guess what? They feel like force, cheap nostalgia to make you go, I know what that is! <laughs> DC League of Super Pets is not very good. I am just as confused as you about why the hell I watched this film. Uh, I don't care about DC, sorry, just never really interested me. Show me this logo and I feel nothing. So when watching this movie, I also felt nothing. I guess the Kevin Hart and Dwayne Johnson dogs were okay. Uh, I didn't like the other pets. I do think that it's absurd that a stupid little hamster was able to defeat Superman and the rest. Like, I might be able to stretch my imagination, but come on. And yeah, that's it. Not much else to talk about. The characters are whatever, the animation's whatever, the story's whatever, and the movie is whatever. If I don't talk about much about a movie today, it's because I genuinely don't have much to say. Part 2 of Disney crapping on the things we loved as a kid. Hocus Pocus 2 is not very good at all. The only good part of it was the witches, and even they aren't as nearly as entertaining in the first one. The magic spells they use, I guess, are also okay, but they don't leave any impact. I also didn't mind the opening where they explain their origins. The old-timey setting is interesting, even if they don't really do anything with it, but now we're in the present, and the movie slowly starts to make you want to turn off your TV, then bash it in. I'm kind of exaggerating for the joke, because the rest of the movie is now filled with unfunny writing, boring scenes, and a humor, if you even want to call it that. The only joke they tell is them being confused by the modern world. I'm surprised the writers didn't cave in and made one of the witches say, Wait a minute, what's an iPhone? It's not really worth getting upset over, but it's still a lame piece of garbage. I didn't get much to enjoy out of Uncharted, if I'm being honest. I've never actually played an Uncharted game, so maybe that's why I didn't enjoy it as much, but I'm assuming the games aren't the most plain, basic, boring adventure movie with action seeds that underwhelm you. Whoa! This adventure is taking place in the jungle and towns? Never seen that before. I didn't mind some of the actors in this, like Tom Holland and the, uh, girl. They weren't awful, but Mark Wahlberg's character was pretty boring. He wasn't really funny or exciting to watch. I actually think the more grounded action scenes, like in the underground club, were actually pretty cool, rather than the over-the-top ones. I do have to talk about one scene that infuriated me to my core, and that's the action scene where Mark Wahlberg and girl villain, I don't really remember her name, fight. Inside of a Papa John's. I just don't understand. I can't get invested in this fight scene because I can see what I ate for dinner in the background. This movie is just really bad. I can't say for sure how accurate it is to the source material because, again, I've never played the original Uncharted. So if you have seen it, please inform me on the accuracy. Okay, moving on. Thor Love and Thunder makes me more upset the more I think about it. Like, I know that this movie could have been good if it wasn't rushed, but it was, and it sucks. There is actually a bit of good stuff here, like Gore. I loved Gore. He was the only part of this movie that I thoroughly enjoyed. When he was on screen, I was having a blast. Sadly, though, he's not in it very much, and he only slays, like, one god on screen, and that sucks. His whole goal throughout the movie is to slaughter all gods, and his character arc is great. I just don't get why we couldn't have like a scene where he's in the realm of the gods and he starts slaughtering everybody, like that would have been awesome. I guess I also like some of the other action stuff, and Jane as a character, um, Russell Crowe as Zeus was funny. Oh, and speaking of comedy... Skies, and flick! Oh! Flick too hard, damn it!
It sucks. Oh, there were some jokes I liked, such as Thor and his hammer and axe, but oh my god, this movie's so unfunny. Hey, remember Screaming Goats? Well, if you watch this movie, you will surely be reminded of them and how unfunny they are in this movie. I literally wrote Screaming Goats in my notes. Like, that's how bad it got. I could talk more about this movie, but I think you get how I feel about this movie, so let's move on. When you watch a simple kind of plain kids movie like Secret Headquarters, you too will struggle to tell me what the hell happened in this movie. I have just one word that signifies the whole movie. Fine. The characters are fine. The action is fine. Everything is just fine. Some stuff I actually didn't mind, like the powers and tech the kids mess with in the uncle's secret base, weren't bad comedy-wise. And the set design down there is also not bad. The CGI and effects also aren't bad. The villain is whatever, and overall, a serviceable kids movie. You are a sad, strange little man, and you have my pity. Before I talk about anything in this movie, let's talk about the continuity of this. When announced, I thought this movie was about the person who inspired the Buzz Lightyear toy, like the Neil Armstrong of this universe, you know? But then it was revealed that it's actually a movie that Andy sees, which inspires him to want a Buzz toy, which kicks off the events of the first Toy Story, and it's it's so stupid. It's so stupid. Okay, uh, about the actual movie, uh, it's not very good either. The most annoying thing about it is the emotional stakes. There isn't any. It tries to have some, but the only stakes we have is Buzz being disappointed in himself, not able to figure out how to get home. But what ruins this is that nobody seems to want to get off the planet. Everybody looks perfectly content on this planet. Why not have everybody be depressed and in anguish so we actually have a reason to want to get off the planet? But no. The comedy is also lacking. There are some laughs to be had, most notably with Socks. I like them a lot, but that's it. The villain also sucks a lot. I'm not going to spoil it so you can see how absurd it is. He just comes out of nowhere all the time when the plot demands an action scene. And the route they go with him just doesn't make any sense at all. The second and third acts are very boring and I basically tuned out at this point. Pointless. Strange World looked pretty good. Then it came out and nobody watched it. That has nothing to do with the quality of the movie, obviously. It has to do with Disney's complete lack of confidence in this movie, and that sucks. But they have every right to, because this movie is whatever. I like the three main characters well enough, Searcher, Ethan, and Jaeger. I think that's how you pronounce it. They are quite enjoyable protagonists. I just wish they were in a better movie. I actually did enjoy that slice of life beginning. It was pretty enjoyable. But then it stops being that and becomes a very generic adventure movie that isn't very good. And the sci-fi elements don't really get fleshed out all that much. I also don't get this one scene where the three characters I mentioned are playing this board game and Jaeger calls out that movies without villains are bad. Inside a movie with no villain. Like, what? None of the other characters made me feel anything. And I wish the whole movie was in the art style of the opening. Like, that part slapped. I also hate the twist at the end, it gives you extreme whiplash because they don't build up to it at all and it makes no sense and infuriates me physically. So that's Strange World, some good things, some bad things, and mostly boring things. He was a good man, until he wasn't. Disenchanted didn't nearly infuriate me as much as Hocus Pocus 2 did. It's still just whatever, but there's stuff to enjoy here, like Morgan and her love interest, uh, I thought they were pretty good, even if they don't do a whole lot. The music is pretty good, which should not come as a surprise. I actually don't mind the villain and her incompetent henchmen. It's a nice homage to villains with pathetic henchmen like Hades and Fear and Panic and Hercules. The animation parts are also alright, except at the end, blech. The concept of her turning into a wicked stepmother is actually cool. I just wished all of this happened a bit sooner, which leads me to my biggest complaint. The setting is atrocious. Not in like the actual design, what I mean is that it's dumb for this specific franchise. Like the first movie has a magical princess from a fantasy world in a sad industrial city. And the second movie is a fantasy town, like 
okay, kind of defeats the whole subversion angle, but whatever. Still not really good, but still better than the rest of the Disney schlock this year. I know what that is! I actually kind of liked some of what Chip and Dale Rescue Rangers did. But what it did, right, probably wasn't intentional and only did for money. Like, answer me this. Do you like the original Rescue Rangers? Then you probably don't like this movie because the other characters besides Chip and Dale don't do anything at all. And only come in in like 30 seconds at the climax. Also, let me address the huge elephant in the room. Oh my god, references! Oh my god, is that Ugly Sonic? Oh my god, bootlegs. <gasps> He-Man and Skeletor? Oh my god, is that the Coca-Cola? Well, actually, I kind of liked him. He's, he was funny. Trust me, I get why they did this. We've got to have money. Some parts are done really well, like all the different animation styles they use. And the villain's goal of turning cartoon characters into bootleg versions to sell, like, damn, that's actually interesting and creative. And then you get scenes at Comic-Con or in the random towns they go to where they just kind of expect you to look around for references the whole time. Ironically enough, the funniest character in the whole movie is one of the original characters they made. You cops. I don't actually remember his name, but he, he was funny, trust me. Yeah, that's it. Not much to say other than... Oh my god, is that... I wasn't even planning on watching this movie when it came out, but then I was like, eh, whatever, I'll watch it. I did actually watch the Halloween 2018 and thought it was pretty good. And obviously the first Halloween, come on, it's a classic. How, how, how could you not watch that movie? It's great. But Halloween Ends is still in an alright movie and it has problems. Like, I don't really understand what happens to Corey. Like, did he just decide on his own to help Michael? Was he possessed? It never really gets an answer. This movie also has a lot of scenes that drag on longer than it really should. And it started to get on my nerves a little bit, to be honest. Michael also does nothing until like 40 minutes in. But man, once he does, the kill count starts going up. The kills are pretty good. And scenes are actually shot very well. Like the final battle with Laurie Strode and Michael. And the final shots of the whole town grabbing up Michael's body. Like that was cool. The beginning of the movie where a younger Cory accidentally kills a kid was really disturbing. In a good way, of course. So yeah, Halloween ends, pretty alright. Do you ever use a real door? I can't believe I'm saying this, but Black Adam isn't as bad as everyone has been saying. Don't get me wrong, there's still a lot of things wrong with it, and I get why people don't like it. But there is uh, quite a bit of stuff in this movie I did enjoy. Such as Black Adam himself. I do get the criticism about his backstory. Like at first you think it's the kid who became Black Adam. But then it's revealed to be the father of the kid after he died. Uh, it kind of gets dropped on us randomly. But in my opinion, while yes annoying. Doesn't really affect my overall enjoyment. Arguably, what I hate more is that he's basically a killing machine. That can do practically anything. That's not interesting. I did like some of the characters. Like the kid, the uncle, and the mom. They were all enjoyable and pretty funny on occasion. You know who I didn't like? The Justice Society. I guess I didn't mind Dr. Faye. He was alright. Hawkman, boring, and kept whining about Black Adam. And the teenagers are not funny. Definitely have way too much screen time dedicated to them. Also, the villain, I guess, turns into Satan at the end. And raises the army of hell and then this goes nowhere also 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 the more cartoony elements are fine on paper but clash very hard with the more darker tone it goes for i mean he literally kills people they really shove the idea of whoa he's not a hero or a villain he's a anti-hero down your throat and yes it's annoying bottom line is well not great it's not nearly as bad as you might think. Merry Christmas to all! Now you're all gonna die! Orbit, you gotta help me! I didn't take my meds yesterday, and I ranked Violent Night as my 15th favorite movie of last year. I, I, I think I'm dying. 
Ah, <laughs> uh, uh, oh yeah, I guess you're right. This movie is ironically a fun time. Like, it's not very emotional or compelling or have character arcs that go through emotional roller coasters. It's about Santa killing a bunch of mercenaries to protect this one family. And the leader of this gang is John Leguizino? All right, I guess Sid from Ice Age got bored one day and decided to commit mass homicide. He's also the funniest part of the movie. You are also actively rooting for some of the family to die. Like the aunt. I hate her. I just wish she died at the end. This movie is also very, very gory. Just felt like bringing that up would be important. So yeah, I should not have put this movie as high as I did, but I don't know, man. I love stupid movies. What can I say? Sea Beast is good. And that is where my thoughts end. I'm joking, of course, but I don't have a lot to say about this movie. I just thought it was good. Okay, okay. I was going to get to that. I like most of the crew we follow on this adventure to kill the Red Beast. I just wish we got to see a little bit more of them. The monster designs are also pretty good. Well, it's more the animation that's good. The This red sea beast design is weird, and I don't very like it all that much. I just also wish we got to see more monsters. They were easily the best part of the movie. I just wanted to see more. I think the scene where the kid and the guy are on the island is kind of boring. And yes, it does kind of feel like Netflix's How to Train Your Dragon, just without some of what made that movie so amazing. Again, not much to say. I like the characters, action, and animation, even though I wish they could have developed things a little bit more. Despite that, I liked it well enough. Luck is another random streaming only animated movie that I had absolutely no expectations for, but surprisingly, really liked it. This movie has a very nice but sad opening, establishing that Sam is a woman who lives at an orphanage because she was never adopted as a kid. She also has the worst luck of any human alive, so that's cool. She is now an 18 year old and is on her own and with a job, and obviously her first day of work goes expect it when you have terrible luck. The first act, I think, perfectly sets up her character. Someone who has terrible luck, but takes in all the pain to make the people she loves happy. Like, that's wholesome as heck. The movie also has really good world building for this world of luck. Like, that's something you can't really say a lot for animated movies nowadays, but we get to see a lot of this luck world, and it's really creative. I like it a lot. I like the characters we meet, like Bob the cat, his leprechaun friend, the leprechaun that hates him, the dragon leader, and of course, Rudy. He's awesome. I love Rudy so much. He's easily the best character in the entire movie. I do have some problems, though. The animation is overall alright, but I don't know. Sometimes the voice actor for Sam says something a little bit more cartoony, and the stiff mouth movement just doesn't match the voice at all, and it just bothered me too much to where I had to bring it up. Bob revealing that he's actually from the land of bad luck kind of comes out of nowhere, and some of the humor and characters just didn't leave that much of an impact on me. Also, why does nobody react to the talking cat in the end? That, that confused me so much. Hey, little kitten. What up? What, what the? You wouldn't like me when I'm angry. I don't like you now. Turning Red was surprisingly very good. From the trailers, this movie didn't look very good at all. It just seemed obnoxious and trying to be <clears throat> hashtag relatable. But no, the movie did not do any of these things. Firstly, I just love the plot. It's just a group of girls trying to raise money so they can go to a concert. It's great. Sure, they market a big fluffy panda along with it, which you would think ruined that slice of life aspect. But no, I think it fits perfectly fine. The characters, though is probably what sells me on this movie the most. They're just fun. Mei Ling was nowhere near as annoying as I thought she was going to be. She's a good protagonist, very entertaining to watch. I thought her other friends were all right. The green one and the one with glasses were fun, but the small one, she was just kind of annoying. The best character relationship though is man or mom. 
They have a nice relationship and a nice conflict of May's mom not believing her daughter can do anything bad, and putting her blame on everyone else. It's a nice angle. I'm glad what they went with. I do have some problems, though. Like, the whole puberty metaphor isn't developed all that much and was kind of pointless, honestly. Humor also wasn't as bad as I thought, but not anything really noteworthy. I don't know, man. This movie is just fun. Definitely better than Lightyear, I'll tell you that. With nice pacing and a fun plot and great characters, Turning Red is pretty good. We're going back in time to the first Thanksgiving to get turkeys off the menu. I honestly didn't know the Adam Project existed until my mom wanted to watch it. Uh, I really liked it. I think it had enough problems to cause it to just miss the top 10 mark. First off, I guarantee you that you will not remember the villain's name. Uh, I don't remember her name. She just is very forgettable. And I argue that they could have done more with the sci-fi concepts a bit. Like, we have Kid Adam and Older Adam. We could have had, you know, a lot more jokes using the whole time travel shtick. But, eh, it doesn't hamper the experience. It was just in the back of my mind while watching. The scenes with Older Adam, played by Ryan Reynolds, and Young Adam, played by Waker... Waker... Waker Scoville? I think that's how you say it. Were pretty entertaining, with them bickering... Uh, they had surprisingly really good chemistry. Uh, they were enjoyable. The scene where older Adam reconnects with his dad, who died. You know, that's why he came back from the future, to prevent his dad's death. Where he talked with him, where his dad helps him grapple with the fact that, you know, he must die. It hit me in those feels. The ending as a whole is very sweet. I would highly recommend this movie. This is the comedy police. The joke's too funny. I'm not going back to jail. Okay, so I was planning on not even talking about this movie in this video. Because the Jackass movies aren't really traditional movies, you know? But then I remember that this movie was playing in theaters, so eh, it counts. And what do I have to say about it? It's hilarious. I know this style of comedy does not work for everyone. And if you hate this movie because of that, then I understand. But personally, I thought it was hilarious. I don't know if it's wrong to put it this high, but what can I say? I had a great time laughing my ass off. I'm not going to talk about Jurassic World Dominion for long, because I already made a 12 minute video discussing my thoughts, so go watch that if you want a better summary. But here's a quick rundown. I think the CGI here looks really good, the concept of the dinosaurs being in the real world leads to infinitely more unique and creative situations. I like most of the characters, except for probably the villain. Dinosaur action and settings are great, uh, the theme of coexistence is also well done. Uh, there is also some things I neglected to mention, like... Why is there barely any death? The previous movies had such iconic kills, but this one, you only really see like four people die, which is disappointing looking back. But, besides a few hiccups here and there, I still really like this movie. Are you flirting with my sister? Yeah, I know, right? What the hell? I am honest to God shocked that I ranked Sonic the Hedgehog 2 here at number 8. To be fair, a lot of the competition is bad or just mediocre, but still, what? So why is this movie so high on my list? It's just a lot of fun. Yeah, even if you're not a big Sonic fan, I feel like you can still have a really good time watching it. The action is fun, the characters are fun, uh, Knuckles is voiced by Idris Elba, which would put this movie in the top 15 alone. Uh, it's funny, though not all the jokes land. Jim Carrey was still obviously funny, though I would say he had better moments in the first one. Uh, I like Agent Stone in this a lot. Uh, he definitely had better scenes than in the first one. Uh, I love the character relationships in this. Well, okay, maybe I would have liked it more if they didn't rush Tails in Sonic's relationship. He basically asks Sonic to be his friend, and... He says yes in like the exact same scene and then they are just BFFs the entire movie. Could have been executed better, but whatever. The ending though, where the five were playing baseball, now that was wholesome as heck. I also guess I have to mention the whole wedding subplot with James Marsden's wife's sister. Not entertaining at all and has way too much time dedicated to it. Other than a couple blemishes, I had a lot of fun with Sonic 2, and I'd say check it out. I just want to know if I finally snapped and lost my mind and I'm putting this movie too high. Yeah. 
Oh my God, Wendell and Wilde is so great. I don't know what it is with Henry Selleck's works, man, but I don't know. They're all so great. Well, except James and the Giant Peach. Uh, that one we could forget, but besides that, this world is so fun to get to know more of. Learning about how the underworld works and how they interact with the mortal world, it's all super good. Kate is a wonderful protagonist, along with all the side characters we meet. The titular Wendell and Wilde are both super funny and entertaining to watch. Then I found out they were voiced by Keegan-Michael Key and Jordan Peele, so yeah, of course they're funny. The stop motion is obviously excellent, and of course there's Belzer. He's funny. He's cool. He's Belzer, man. I love him. I want to keep this review to a minimum because I genuinely want you to watch this movie. It's very good. Here comes the airplane! In preparation for this movie, I watched the first Top Gun. And it's whatever. I had quite a few problems. So I was amazed to find that this movie was surprisingly amazing. And also had quite a few problems. Just, just give me a minute and I'll explain. There are a lot of talking scenes, and they are all mixed in how good they are. Some are very, very cheesy, some get me more invested, then others just make me go, uh. There is also a lot of flashback scenes. They're alright, but they just happen so often to where you're like... <laughs> Most of the characters are very forgettable, or kind of annoying. And this movie's attempts at humor just doesn't always land. Taking all these problems into account, why is the movie practically grazing the top five? The flight scenes. Yeah, they're that good. The action of the movie sells the price of admission alone. And certain shots, like the beginning of the movie, is very well done. So in my opinion, everything outside of the action scenes were either just alright or painful, whatever. But the action scenes, especially the last 30 minutes... Make this an automatic 8 out of 10. Like, they are that good. So now we prepare for the top 5. The Mighty 5. The 5 Wonders of 2022. And these movies deserve more than just a random clip from some random video or movie. They deserve an announcement. Penzi, prepare the music. And now, number 5 is... I think if they had to make a Black Panther movie without T'Challa in it, this is how you would do it. Well, except a few things, but I'll get to that later. First off, the emotional arc that these characters go through, mourning the death of T'Challa and reflecting on his legacy is really powerful. And I think the movie just works because the side characters were so entertaining in the first Black Panther. So of course, a movie about them would be entertaining. There's just one problem with this. So at one point, the white guy, whose name is slipping from me, shows up, and I'm like, oh, that's a cool cameo. And then he showed up again, and I'm like, alright, I guess he's more than just a cameo. But then he kept showing up more, and more, and more! And his scenes are uninteresting and unfunny, and it was just very annoying and breaks the nice pacing the movie had. Whew. Okay, now that I got that off my chest, we could finally start talking more about why this movie is good. Like I said, all of the side characters who are now main characters are great. The presentation and effects are amazing, especially compared to the crap of Thor Love and Thunder. The score and acting are also pretty great. Uh, Namor is, in my opinion, a pretty good villain. He's incredibly intimidating and his motivation is strong. I just think that he's brought down because he arrived after Killmonger, who is infinitely more compelling. Some of the characters don't do a lot and get shafted in the third act, but it's not a huge issue. Ooh, and the twist near the end, which I won't spoil, where Shuri talks to a character. It's amazing. Yeah, and that, that's the movie. It's, it's great, and you should definitely go check it out. My number four spot goes to... I am just as shocked as you are. When it was first announced... I didn't even want to check it out at first, because I thought it was going to be a lazy sequel or reboot that was riding off the coattails of the first, like that horrible Home Sweet Home Alone movie we got last year. But then I realized, this is Warner Brothers, not a Disney movie, so maybe that means it might be good. And yes, 
It is really good. As someone who is very nostalgic for the first Christmas story, this feels like a natural direction for all the characters and writing style to end up. They still do the whole narration thing and do it just as well in my opinion. It's just a wholesome movie with Ralphie struggling to write his father's obituary. The movie also has a mixed way of delivering references and nostalgia to the original. There's a lot of well done nostalgia like in Ralphie's mom's attic and some forced nostalgia like when he yells out to his kids, make sure he doesn't kick you in the face. The bar scene where he reconnects with his friends is so well done and yeah, Schwartz got what he deserved, being poor and not being able to pay back his tab. I hated him in the original. So yeah, I don't care, Schwartz. I hope you're drowning in debt, you deadbeat. Hey, Orbit. What's the news? Thanks, Orbit. That's actually really sweet of you. Mmm. Mmm. Mmm, this is good. Mmm. Mmm. What? No, I'm talking about Christmas Story Christmas. Home Sweet Home Alone came out in 2021. What joke? What? And number three goes to... Okay, dude. Dude. This movie. This movie right here. It freaking rules. I'm not going to talk about it for long because I genuinely want you to go watch this movie. It's that good. So let me talk about some things that I have to point out about why this movie is so good. Well, kind of. Alright, my one and only complaint is not Geppetto's design... It's just that he looks the same when his son was alive, which they say was a while ago, as he does at the end. So in my opinion, the passage of time isn't really felt, but that's just a tiny nitpick. All of the things I didn't like in the original Pinocchio movie is now gone. The designs for all the characters really sell the darker tone they go for, and the stop motion is gorgeous. The surprising thing, though, is that the star of this movie, in my opinion, is Geppetto. Simply because of his arc of learning to let go of his hatred for Pinocchio. For simply not being like his dead son and accepting him for being, well, Pinocchio. And not someone else is sad in the most beautiful kind of way. There are more characters, more scenes, and more elements to talk about, but... I want you to go and experience it for yourself. It is a beauty that, in my opinion, everyone should watch. And the number two spot goes to... I don't know what it is about this movie, but every time I rewatch it, I love it more and more every time. I feel like this movie is just an objectively worse movie than some of the movies before it, but this is my list. And I have way too much fun with this movie to not give it the number two spot. I've already made a video about this movie if you want more detailed descriptions of my thoughts, but let me just summarize them. I love the characters. They have such a wonderful introduction and over the course of the movie, you get invested in their relationship, which makes the breakup scene at the end of the movie that much more sad. The arc that Wolf goes through wanting to be good is perfectly, and I mean perfectly, capped off with the subtle saying of off with good behavior. All these months later, and I still get emotional at those words in that order. The music also grew on me more on rewatch. I can't say the same thing for the humor. That... That, that did not get better for me, and it's still the weakest thing about the movie. I not mind the villain as much as I did, he, he was still entertaining, just a little plain and predictable. But yeah, if you want more details, watch that old video. If not, this movie brings me so much joy when I watch it, I just have to give it the second place. And you are guilty, it's a minor legal infraction, case closed, I win, and you <laughs> But now you may be asking, what about number one? Well, and at the number one spot, 
best movie of 2022 goes to... Probably not what you're expecting, right? Trust me, I know you're confused too. Understandable. But this is why. Out of all the movies on this list, it accomplished the one thing I love when movies do. It's able to balance being funny, being entertaining, and being emotional, being dark, and having compelling themes all at once. Which just makes this movie an absolute joy to watch. I did not go into a Puss in Boots movie and expect to think about my own mortality. But watching Puss grapple with his own mortality and learning to value his one life left and spending it the best he can? <laughs> I'm not crying. You're crying! Yeah, I have to admit it. This, this film made me cry. It, it was this scene where Puss runs away from a big fight scene. Well, actually, it was the antagonist, but I'll mention him later. Perito, yes, that's the dog's name, and it is great, runs after him, wanting to know what's wrong. He then sees Puss having a panic attack next to a tree. And they mention early in the movie that Perito is training to be a therapy dog. Puss, of course, teases him for it. You know, at first you think this is just a throwaway line, just to be funny and annoy Puss more. But then we see it in play. Perito places his head on Puss's thigh, and Puss's breathing slows, calming him. Like, holy god, this is a Puss in Boots movie. Oh, and every other character is entertaining and amazing in their own right. I'm not going over all of them right now because I want to dedicate an entire video going over my thoughts. Might not happen for a while, but definitely as soon as I can. A few more things though before we finish the list. Uh, the music slaps so hard. Go listen to Fearless Hero right now. It's a banger. And obviously, I have to mention death. He's so intimidating, and I don't mean he's death metaphorically, or rhetorically, or poetically, or theoretically, or in any other fancy way. He's death. Straight. Up. He's of course great, and a perfect antagonist to Puss's dilemma. And actually, kind of scary. Like, the whistle he does when near, it will give you goosebumps the first time you hear it. It's horrifying. That first scene in general is a perfect introduction. So yeah. Puss in Boots, 9 out of 10. Maybe even a 10 out of 10. Uh, is it better than Avatar 2? Uh, probably. That's, that's, that, I feel like that's just a given. And there we have it. 2022 was an interesting year for cinema. We had many misses, but just as many bangers. But a lot of ho-hum whatevers. But you can say that for every year. The animation industry, though, besides most of the Disney products, this was one hell of a year for animated films, especially DreamWorks. I really hope they can keep up this pace. <sighs> I spoke too soon. Good night, and remember to go watch Puss in Boots, please. There was only like a few teens and babies when I saw it. Please watch it, please.